Hello, everybody. It's Rob Seaver, Executive Director with Leeds Council. I'm here with yet again one of our Leadership Wear, uh, Series webinar. I'm super excited about this one, as I, I am with every one of them. But this one in particular is really exciting for me because this is a multi-year effort that has now culminated into the finish line of getting our buyer's guide updated and out to the public. So that is going to be like the caveat, the real win for everybody that's attending today. You're going to get a link to download this thing. And I'm super excited because this has been through many companies and many iterations of, of, of development. Uh, I'm here with uh, our moderator, which I'm about to turn over to, Grace Kingston from Infutor. But before I do that, I wanna just do a couple of housekeeping rules. Our panelists have agreed to answer questions as they can throughout this event. And in your control panel, there should be a questions box as you expand some of the things on the right of your screen or left, depending on where you have it. And in that questions box, if you can just ask your questions, we're all monitoring those. And, and during the duration of the webinar, if we can get to them, uh, we will definitely try. Uh, at the end of this, I'm going to be pushing out the link so that everybody can download this and then I'll follow it up with an email. So once again, I wanna introduce our moderator for the day. That's Grace Kingston from Infutor. Grace, thank you very much. It's your show. Thanks, Rob, I appreciate it. I appreciate you uh, asking me to be part of this amazing webinar with all these industry experts. I probably should first introduce myself and let you know a little bit more about myself and why I was asked to participate in a lead buying webinar. First, my name, as Rob said, is Grace Kingston. I'm with Infutor. We are a consumer identity management expert. So anyone who's been to Connect to Convert or LeadsCon, you've probably heard our name before. You probably didn't know how to say our name, um, but it's Infutor. And we're one of the top consumer data providers and have been supporting the lead generation space now for many years. And so a lot of our lead generation partners leverage our identity graph that includes nearly every adult individual and property in the U.S. We help them verify, enhance, complete, update, and we can even help them identify who their best leads are, where they come from, and then how to find more of those leads um, for them and in that space. So find highly targeted leads. So now that my little intro is over and out of the way, and out of the way, to, I'd love to introduce the panelists introduce today. The panelists today. Um, are you guys hearing an echo? Is that me only? Okay. Rob, what are you doing back there? I think we're good now. Um, each panelist is a leader in this industry and they've contributed a great deal of time, energy, sweat, probably some tears into this buyer's guide, which all of you will have access to at the end of this webinar. We really want this to be interactive, like Rob mentioned, so feel free to shoot us some questions and um, we'll do our best to answer them. First, I want to introduce Eric. I want to introduce Eric. 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 Some background. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, a little bit. You're breaking. It's breaking up. I think you're good now. I think you're okay. If, uh, go ahead and uh, Eric, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, start with your intro, I think we can clear it up here in a, a second. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Eric Kozak. I'm a senior director with American Standard Brands. Um, I manage lead generation for American Standard Brands. We are the world's largest manufacturer sinks and toilets and faucets. You guys probably use our products every single day. So my career is literally in the toilet. <laughs> I love all the stuff about that. Dustin, uh, I'll let you go next, see if you could top what Eric's intro was like. <laughs> for sure, I'll try. Bastian Kalser, Digital Marketing Manager for American Standard Brands. And I run the Performance Marketing Channel for our national home services business. And uh, I'm the number one guy in the number two business. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. John, can you give us an intro? Yeah, John Galloway, I'm Vice President of Business Development for Veterans United Home Loans. Veterans United is a consumer direct mortgage company. Uh, we're operating in all 50 states uh, and we specialize in making mortgages uh, to veterans and military spouses. I've been with Veterans United for almost eight years now and I, and just focus on uh, advertising uh, partnerships, uh, whether lead gen or display advertising. Perfect, thank you for that. And then Francesco, last but not least. Yeah, so I'm Francesco Panini. I am uh, the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Affiliates at uh, Freedom Financial Network. Um, 
We provide uh, unsecured personal loans, mostly tailored for debt consolidation, and we also do debt settlement. Um, I've been in the space, or I've been at Freedom Financial Network for seven years, and I've been in kind of the lead gen space for about 14 years and also worked in mortgage and insurance in the past as well. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Well, we're really excited. We really appreciate all of your panelists for joining. You know, I think the conversation today is going to be really strategic around the process of lead buying. So, you know, whether you're new to the lead buying business or you've been doing it for years, this conversation today will provide an interesting insight into how these in industry veterans are approaching their, their buying process. And so to start up the conversation, you know, I wanted to first kind of level the playing field. Um, you know, I kind of think it's a joke in the industry where you hear all these terms, you know, being tossed around, whether companies refer to it, you know, that sell leads as lead generators, lead aggregators, lead sellers, providers, um, third party affiliates, to name a few. And just for the purpose of this discussion, we're going to be using the term lead aggregator, but all of those terms will be referring to are of individuals that sell leads. So, Eric, let's start with the basics. Can you help us understand how lead aggregators collect leads? Sure. Um, lead aggregators uh, are companies that own um, products that are um, driving traffic to uh, products being like websites. They, they could own a variety of different websites uh, in multiple verticals where there is an expressed interest. Uh, it could be home improvement. It could be mortgage loans. It could be any kind of thing and they're promoting content they're buying advertising to promote their websites and promote their content and they are collecting uh leads from people that are expressing interest in that vertical of products so um they could own a home improvement uh website and then people that are looking for home improvement remodeling jobs could be submitting leads into from that uh, website and then that lead aggregator is going out and finding customers lead buyers like ourselves who mm -hmm. um, can help fulfill that uh, customer's request for information or services it could be a lead form it could be a digital uh, lead someone filling out a form it could be a phone call um, there are multiple ways to define the lead perfect thank you for that that was very helpful and you know i think we'll, we'll cover some of the different types of leads now so francisco turning to you can you talk a little bit more about you know, the differences between a shared versus exclusive lead and how, how different buyers should approach this? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, I'd like to start off by saying um, no lead is truly exclusive ever, right? Um, you know, sometimes people tend to think that because they bought uh, one lead from a lead aggregator, that no one else is going to potentially be calling on that consumer. You know, most consumers are much more savvy than that and they are still shopping around. Um, so there's, that's one thing to always keep in mind. Um, that being said, you know, I think, share, you know, when you're looking at shared leads versus exclusive leads per se, you know, it really depends on where you are as a buyer, right? Um, if you are, you know, let's say the top of the food chain, you have a great dialing system, um, you think you can get to that person before anyone else, a shared lead may be a better approach because you have the technology and infrastructure to, um, to work the lead properly and get to and be the first one basically to talk to that cons potential consumer. Um, those leads tend to be cheaper, obviously, because they are being shared. Um, and one thing to always know is how many times they're being shared. Um, you know, one of the interesting things when I look back in my past at, um, you know, in the mortgage industry, for example, um, when I, I first started this company, we sold leads up to five times, let's call it. Um, what we realized though, was selling the lead three times was actually more optimal for our clients. So understanding how many times they're shared, right, is a really good question to also ask when you're buying leads. Is it shared three times, five times, eight times, two times? Um, that'll kind of give you a gauge of how many people you may be, or how many competitors you may be going against, right? Um, exclusive leads, I think, are really beneficial when you're potentially a smaller company um, who maybe doesn't have the infrastructure or technology to really go in there and, you know, maybe beat out somebody who is, you know, millions of dollars in infrastructure and technology to get there first. Um, you know, so again, back into kind of, let's say my insurance days, um, we had certain smaller insurance, local carriers who only, or agents, I should say, who only wanted to buy exclusive leads because they could, you know, not have to be on the phone with them within three or four seconds to beat out someone else. Now those leads tend to be obviously more expensive because they have to cover the cost but can be much more beneficial for someone who maybe is, is hindered by the technology piece of it. 
Um, and then I think the final thing that I would want to bring up about exclusives and um, shared leads is understanding the industry that you're in is very important. Um, I'll give you an example for us. Um, we are in the debt settlement space. We tend to stay away from shared leads um, because we want to be able to really tell the consumer our story and, and curate that story about what the actual product is because a lot of people don't understand debt settlement. So rather than letting them hopefully, you know, if they come to us, we're going to be as forthright and honest uh, with them as far as the program, the good parts and the bad parts. Uh, and I think that transparency is important. Um, when you are competing on a shared lead model, uh, there tends to be sometimes that transparency isn't always there depending on who they speak with. So we, in the debt settlement space, at least for freedom debt relief, we feel very strongly about exclusive leads on that side. That makes sense. Thank you. You know, what I heard you say is, you know, it really kind of depends on the industry you're in and how your business is, is, is structured and modeled, and that's going to help you dictate you know, which one might make the most sense for, for your organization. So I appreciate that. John, can you give us a little bit of insight on how your company looks at shared versus ex exclusive leads? Yeah, I, I think a lot of what I would echo what Francesco just said in terms of shared versus exclusive. We So coming at it from the mortgage perspective, thinking about what a loan officer who's going to call on a lead is going to experience. And then you also mm -hmm. have to take from the perspective, what's the consumer going to experience? Uh, Francesco alluded to a lot of this, is you, you need to build up and the way we have done it is the experience for the loan officers got to be different than an exclusive lead. An exclusive lead, you might be able to call a little slower because you don't need to be first. You, you purchased it, though, to Francisco's point. It might be getting sold seven days later. It could be getting sold 30 days later. So that's something I would say if you're buying, you really need to look at who you're buying from and what they're going to do. Did they say it's exclusive for a time period? Did they say it's exclusive forever? And that's the same with shared. It could be sold five times instantly, but then it is sold another five times 14 days later. That's something we are always looking at. But getting back to what we, we always let our, our originators, our loan officers, know that it's uh, shared. So they're going to have to – they're in a little bit more competition when they're talking to a customer. This is a customer who, uh, if they knew they were filling out a shared lead, and that's the other thing from the customer perspective, does the customer know they're share, filling out a shared lead? That's, these are the things we're going through. We're monitoring that experience. Does the customer realize they're going to have their, their information sent to three to five people? Does the customer know who's going to receive that information? Like, does it have a confirmation window that says it's going to Veterans United, then XYZ, then ABC? Or does it just say, hey, we've connected you with some people and they're going to call you and you don't know how many of them are going to call you unless you read the fine print. That, that's something we're looking at in terms of our buys and we're communicating that to our loan officers so that they know when they're called, does this customer know who you are? And if they don't, you're going to have to do a lot more introduction, a lot more rapport building. Uh, that's one piece. If they already know who you are, then maybe you can skip a little bit of that uh, introduction phase. But that that is that's a big difference for us between shared and exclusive. We tend to like exclusive, but shared as long as you treat them correctly and you understand what you're working with, and you have a process set up to call quickly and then have follow-ups, make multiple attempts. That's going to be key uh, in that in that shared space. But those are kind of some of the things uh, we're looking at. But the main thing the loan officer knows is shared. And the customer knows that it's shared because, and that's something you got to do in the upfront when you're contracting and working on your insert order, is really looking at that experience. And if somebody's hesitant to share with you what the customer's going through, that could be a sign. And when you're buying it, you know it deeper. That makes sense. Thank you. You know, I think what I'm hearing you say is there's a lot of communication and collaboration being done, you know, on both sides of it with your customers, with the, you know, the individuals calling these individuals, with the lead aggregators. And it's actually a great segue kind of into our next question. And this one's a big one that we get in the space is, you know, how do you find the right lead aggregator? I think all of you probably have some great insight into this. And, you know, I'm sure you've had to work closely with lead aggregators throughout COVID and, and kind of adjusting and changing your strategy. So I'd be interested to hear from each one of you, you know, how, what you look at when you're evaluating a lead aggregator and um, what you look for in a partner. Bastian, I'll, I'll let you start, but I'll definitely give each one of you some time to answer this one. 
Perfect. So I think uh, the good news here is the buyer's guide, the Leeds Council buyer's guide has a ton of great tips and information on exactly how we do this, right? Um, for us in American Standard, I think uh, you have to talk about the boat mechanic, right? So we have this huge container ship, right? This huge container ship, multi-million dollars of products on this ship. And this captain is about ready to take his ship off the port, right? Deliver this products. And all of a sudden the engine fails. And like most big ships, they have mechanics in-house. And so these mechanics go down and try to fix this problem, but they couldn't, they can't fix it, right? And like everything else, time is money, right? For mm -hmm. these, these captains. And so this captain calls up this expert, expert mechanic and this expert mechanic goes, and he talks to the current mechanics that are in the ship and he looks at the engine bay and you know, these are two story engines, multi-million dollar engines. And this mechanic kind of looks around and, and out of his tool bag, he pulls out this ordinary hammer, just like a hammer you can buy like a Home Depot. And he walks over to this certain part of the engine and he gets his hammer out and he whacks the engine. And sure enough, the engine fires right up. Boom, 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 boom. Captain's ecstatic. And while he's walking the mechanic out of the boat, uh, the captain says to the mechanic, so how much is it gonna cost me? And the mechanic says, well, sir, it's gonna be $20,000. The captain's like taken back. He's like, um, you were here like 30 minutes. How is this gonna cost me $20,000? Like you didn't really do anything. Like $20,000, are you serious? The mechanic's like, sir, it's $20,000. Um, so the captain's a little frustrated. He tells the mechanic, hey, look, just send me an itemized invoice. When I get back, I'll talk about it, but right now I'm like, I'm, I'm late as it is. And so the mechanic leaves, the captain has a successful delivery of the cargo, gets back to his office when he's done with his trip and he looks at this invoice and he opens it up. And sure enough, it says $20,000, you know, it was like a nightmare or anything. And uh, there's two line items on this invoice, right? Line item number one, it says hitting the engine with a hammer, $100. <laughs> number two says knowing where to hit. $19,900. Like most big companies, American Standard has robust internal marketing resources. But what we found works really well is leveraging lead aggregators like this expert mechanic who just know where to hit. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at lead aggregators, find someone who has history of knowing where to hit. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. A uh, nice storytelling you got there. I was hoping you weren't going to start to get too technical with mechanics because they would have lost me. <laughs> awesome. Uh, John, you're next. What do you look for in a lead aggregator? Yeah, we know, I mean, there, there's the entire process. You got to have somebody who's transparent. So if you're talking to somebody and you say, how are you generating my leads? And they're like, well, that's proprietary. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you how I'm doing it. I'm just doing it. And I'm going to send you contacts. Uh, that is going to be a red flag for us. What we're looking for somebody is transparent in terms of how they're driving it, whether it's email traffic, whether it's paid search, if it's organic. Um, and, and then when you get into all of that, what, what are they putting out there to convince a customer to go to a landing page and fill out a lead? Are they, is, is it a free iPad or are they really in our space? Are they really saying, hey, you, would you like to get pre-qualified for a mortgage? Somebody who answers yes, I'd like to get pre-qualified for a mortgage and converts and then comes to us has a lot of intent and, and that is of value. Somebody who's clicked on an ad that said, I want a free iPad and then they come through and convert and then our loan officer calls and they're like, but what about my free iPad? That is, that's going to be problematic. And uh, uh, in addition to the cost of the lead, we have uh, cost of employee time. So we're going to look for somebody who's very transparent, and then we're going to look for somebody who wants to have a feedback loop. That's going to be really big for us, is being able to talk to you about how the leads are performing through the funnel all the way to close, different milestones. And I, every vertical is different, right? American Standard has different uh, milestones from Veterans United. But somebody who really wants to dig into that and understand how what they're doing to drive a conversion can impact past conversion, even past contact with our with our loan officer. Those would be two key things we're looking for. Perfect. Thank you. I just want to throw it out there to the audience, by the way, you know, feel free to ju jump in here. He's got a, a panel of industry experts. You know, if you have any questions about return policies, licensing terms, filter management, whatever it may be, you know, here's, here's your time to ask away. Um, 
but until we get some more questions, Eric, I'll I'll turn it over to you to and to probably add on what uh, Bastian highlighted. I can't duplicate his awesome boat story, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know I think uh, both the panelists so far have hit a couple of things that are are important. I, you know, just to put some specifics down, right? When I talk to a um, a a uh, elite aggregator, it's existing relevant history in the space that's what i look for are you in the space right now i don't want to learn with you i, I want you to be the expert that's why we're going to you because i can go spend money on scm i can go spend money on tv i can go spend money on direct mail tell me that you're an expert in this vertical and show me why and be transparent about it as uh, john said um, on how you're delivering that traffic no black hat uh, scm seo tactics uh, relevant, genuine interest from customers, non-incentivized, you know, I don't want to buy leads from people who are just looking to get a free iPad. It doesn't work that way and I shouldn't have to, to, to spend that money. Now, you can buy that traffic, you can get it, and if you think it's, it can work for you, price it right um, if, if you want to go down an incentivized path. But, um, uh, you know, the history in the space is important. I also really look for people that own their own data if they're doing emailing um, uh, it, it campaigns. So if there's a lead generator that's out there and they're using email as a source for traffic, I really look that they that they own their own data and that they're an expert in emailing their own data. Um, they can be emailing out to other third parties and that can be part of it, but I really look for them to, to kind of own it, you know, when it comes to, to email lead generators. And why uh, is that, or, Eric? Why, why does that make a difference to you? Because you as a, as a buyer um, could be buying that lead in other areas. So that lead, uh, that emailer um, could be going and bro buying an, uh, the, the lists out from multiple people. And that lead could, that person, that, that record in that data could be getting multiple offers from multiple uh, places where you are, um, where you are um in a sense getting multiple leads so with a with a person that owns their own data it's cleaner it's it's more compliant they control mm -hmm. it and it kind of forces them to be a little bit you know on the hook to for metrics they can't say well we tried this list and it didn't work so just look at you know stuff like that um relationship is big right sitting down and talking to a person and just having an open and honest conversation you know where's the traffic coming from how are you providing these leads what type of traffic it is it, it, it um you know so just a couple of things there perfect thank you i appreciate it thanks for diving deeper on that for me um francisco is there anything that you want to add no i think they, they've touched on a lot of it i mean uh, you know going back to the free ipad right it, it, I used to say all traffic is decent traffic if you know how to work the traffic. So I think, you know, in certain cases, even that traffic can work. Um, certainly um, for me, it doesn't work, but I have had instances where it does work. I think, I mean, to be very, you know, maybe kind of a captain obvious here, there are companies out there that if you're just getting into the space are well-known brands that obviously work for people um, that you can potentially partner with right away. I think, once you start to spread outside of those companies, a lot of them are on the leads council, right? These companies, so they're they're out there and and they're transparent. Um, I think once you venture out, that's when you have to do due diligence, really. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, we got a, actually got a question from the audience. How do you decide which marketing activities you want to keep in house first, working with an outside partner? Bastian, I'll, I'll give that one to you. Um, I think it's uh, multifaceted. So number one is capacity, right? Um, what Eric said is, um, do you have experience in the space? And if not, like, can you find um, someone that does have experience, right? Do you have the capacity to manage that? If you're running an SEM program and you're doing, you know, $5,000 a month in SEM, that's one thing. If you're doing $2 million a month in SEM, that's a whole nother thing, right? A huge, huge scale to that. So do you have the capacity and experience? And that's the second thing it was experience. Like, do you know that space? Um, do you know enough, uh, enough to challenge your partners? Um, if you decide to work with a partner to make sure you're getting the best uh, quality and return in, in that space. 
Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so now we've got you know a good understanding of how you look for partners. You have some trusted partners. Leads are flowing. Um, now I want to talk about how do you understand you know which leads are best? Is it based on cost for a conversion? Are there specific channels that are higher performing than others? So John, can you maybe give us some details on how how do you evaluate you know what what the, the best lead is and or best leads are and, and what they look like? Yeah, I, I think there, there's a, a few things that are across all verticals, like bad number. Uh, when a lead comes in, how many times is what you received that got a bad number or a bad email address? Or uh, you call Tom and instead you get Sam. How many? Uh, how mm -hmm. much is that happening? So that that uh, because there is a cost to finding out if a lead is a bad number. So a uh, lead may cost ten dollars, but now I've had you know, employees make outreach to that, that lead is now a lot more expensive than $10. So that that's that's something we're gonna look at. We're also gonna look at uh, duplicates. I think that that is something that is across verticals you're looking at. How often, uh, clearly they're having problems turning over their traffic, or maybe their traffic isn't turning over very much because I, I've bought Tom Smith's name five times in the last 30 days. There's clearly, and there's a cost to that, right? So I've had to find that out. Mm -hmm. You either had a system to dupe that out or you had somebody um, find that out uh, via a phone call or an email or a text message. So once we get past that point, thing, what we're going to look at is, and I think every vertical and every company's got to figure that out, is different intent milestones. Somebody who picks up your phone call, at least has some intent to have been called and answer the call, then do, if you just look at the mortgage vertical, do they have intent to get pre-qualified. Are they really interested in getting that home financing? So that that's something uh, we're going to look at uh, throughout the funnel. But I said that that is what we're looking at, and then we're tying it back to the initial cost. Uh, well, I think uh, Francesco said it like every lead is a good lead if it's priced right and you have the ability to to work it. Uh, there are certain leads that are worth a, a lot more because they just don't take many calls. Uh, the person generally is knows what they're doing and has high intent. Some people are, you know, they're kind of on the fence. They're, they're kind of, maybe they don't know what faucet they want. Maybe they're not really sure what faucet they want. I, I'll let the American Standard folks talk to that. But uh, it's just how much has that traffic source uh, prepared the customer for what's about to happen? That's something mm -hmm. else uh, we're seeing. And those milestones can oftentimes be a reflection of that. But in the way we're judging it, we're looking all the way down to essentially what we were hoping that customer wants to do, which is to buy a home. So how much did it cost in terms of marketing spend to get somebody all the way to a uh, home closing? And for us, that can be a very long process. So, and, and I think other verticals are probably the same. The eventual purchase can take a while. So you have to find metrics in between uh, conversion and ultimate transaction with your company to judge your marketing and spend. That makes sense. You know, I think we, we hear a lot of that in our space where we're working with, you know, lead generators, lead buyers, lead aggregators, and it can be as simple as, you know, we need to be able to make sure this phone is routable and viable. You know, is it actually going to go out or is it going to be a dead end all the way to being able to understand more data and attributes about those individuals and, it, and how likely are they actually to, to convert, not just pick up the phone, but have interest in this product and solution. So that makes a lot of sense. Francisco, um, I'm going to have you jump in there as well. How do you guys uh, evaluate which leads are the best? Yeah, I, I mean, for, for us, um, as far as the actual leads uh, on our end, we drive a lot to our own and operated sites. So a lot of our partners um, actually drive the leads to, like I said, our own and operated. So therefore we kind of have different milestones within our sign up process and or in, I shouldn't say sign up, but inquiry process where they're inquiring about the product that give us kind of indications on intent, right? So um, for us, we have um, the PII page, which is your personal information page. We have that kind of split into two. Um, we know that if the consumer fills out the second part of the, of the personal information page, uh, the second page, that there's a high intent there, right? Um, we start asking a little bit more detailed questions such as date of birth, your street address, things like that. Um, in our industry, because we're in the financial services and um, John can probably speak this as well, you know, we're actually doing a soft credit pull there, right? So if the consumer puts in their information and we're able to pull their credit line, um, we know that's a, 
one, it's it's a quality lead because it's a real person. Um, and then two, we know there's a high intent there for it. Um, um, as when we're buying leads, it's a little bit different, right? Uh, as far as intent. And I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, how is the customer coming through this funnel that's being, you know, generating this lead, right? Um, I think understanding the message from the creative all the way through the form, all the way to the thank you you've been matched with, Freedom Debt really, for example. Um, understanding the customer journey is, is really important. Um, and then there's things on the back end, obviously, the scoring models, lead routing, uh, those are all very important as well. Um, but as a marketer, more on the front line, uh, I'm always looking at that customer journey and understanding how that consumer was presented um, us as a potential solution for them. Okay. That makes sense. So it sounds like, you know, there's multiple aspects that you're taking into consideration from making it easy for the customer while being able to kind of gauge that interest or intent early on in the process by splitting the, the forms into two with the PII. <laughs> Looks like we got a little guest panelist with us. Hi, Pop. <laughs> Too cute. Don't get me distracted with dogs. I will never get back to the topic. Sorry. We have, a, we have another question from the audience. Um, what percentage of leads should convert? And convert? Because I think that obviously means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. To so someone that actually has intent in the product, uh, 25%, 50%, you know, does anybody want to jump on that one or should I just pick one of you? I, I don't I can, this is Francesco. I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Eric. No, Francesco, you go ahead. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I think for this one, it depends on the industry, right? Um, every industry has different benchmarks of close rates and whatnot. Um, you know, for us, I have two products that really drive most of our revenue, right? And one debt settlement, very not known product, um, kind of a painful process to go through. It's not easy to go through debt settlement. Um, and, you know, it, it, there's a lot of education that goes around it, right? And there's a lot of disclosure that goes around it. And, you know, that disclosure sometimes causes people to say, you know what, this isn't the right product for me. So, you know, when we're looking at the debt settlement space, you know, I'm looking at, you know, depending on the source and the channels and whatnot, you know, anywhere from 2% to 10%, right? But it really depends on, is it search? Is it an affiliate? Is it display? What is it? Um, but then when I look at the personal loan side of things where people are highly motivated and they know what the product is and they are looking to receive a money, unsecured money, you know, we do personal loans from 10 to $40,000. I mean, you're seeing high conversion rates on the form, people who do pre-qualify because they have to go through a pre-qualification engine. Um, a lot of times we'll take the offer. There's a high take rate, right? And we're talking, you know, 30, 40%, um, which is much higher. So I think it, it really, you, it's your industry specific. Is, is it's very important. And then also understanding the source of traffic, right? Search is going to do a lot better than, I don't know, call it display, right? As far as conversion rates. Yeah, I think for Eric, you have more? Yeah, he, Francesco hit all that stuff really well. Um, you know, one of the illustrations that I, I would kind of just bring a little bit further out is that media and leads and where the leads are originating from, from their sources, from your lead aggregators, are all going to convert at different levels. And um, the trick is to be able to establish that baseline of that media group and source and have that, that be a target for your lead aggregators to hit consistent give them a goal this is what mm -hmm. we needed to convert at and challenge them to be a partner with you um, to be able to achieve that goal and you know if it fails short in terms of conversion that opens up the opportunity is the media price right are these leads priced right because my conversion metrics are off of what I'm kind of looking at so you know when when you look of leads in in terms of converting I think you have to segment it out, not just on the media group, but if you're savvy enough and you have strong partners, you can break it out by subsource. You know, it's not just a lead coming from this aggregator, it's a lead from this source from this aggregator that you can break down and to the funnel. So, you know, when you look at the reviews, and if you're working with a strong aggregator, you should be having these review calls. Um, you can say, well, this source did not work. We need to eliminate it or right price it. And we need to increase on this higher converting one. So, um, you know, just a little bit more illumination to it. I would also say, find your ROI that works for you and target for that. Find the cost per order, cost per sale, whatever that target is that you have as a goal, 
and give that to the aggregators and say, mm -hmm. this is my goal. Help me achieve it. Be, be Bastion's hammer, you know, in his boat. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that that's a good way to, uh, to approach it. What a great question. Awesome. So it sounds like, you know, it's, it's helping them set those goals, understand those goals, understanding the ROI. Um, I'm sure part of that, Eric, has to, go, has to evolve around, you know, the, the quality of the lead, being able to validate and score those incoming and inbound leads. Can you help us understand how American Standard validates and measures your, your incoming leads? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, Bastion is actually, he's, uh, you know, the affiliate uh, manager on the, uh, in the organization, and he does a tremendous job of, of working with the um, filters that we have in place to be able to accept the leads that we want and uh, reject the leads that we don't want. And you as a buyer entirely have that right. And um, there are technology that the technology groups that are out there, whether you're looking at um, you know, Active Prospect or Jornaya as sources for this, um, where you can be able to set filters for the leads, exactly the leads that you want. And if you're working with an aggregator, a quality one that's established who you know, is going to be in your quiver of arrows that you're going to use in your marketing plans, they should be able to integrate into those filters without a problem. Um, and that's going to help you keep you compliant, help you uh, define leads that you only want to accept. Bastian, I will actually kick this over to you to explain a little bit about how you filter it for, for us in the home improvement space, because he's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I learned everything from Eric, so. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it definitely starts. Good answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Eric, we can talk about compensation a little bit later. No. <laughs> yeah, got it. Um, yeah, so it starts uh, with knowing who your customer is and like, uh, what is that top converting customer? What do they look like? And then whatever that is, model to that. So mm -hmm. in the home services, like we have specific things that we look at, but if you know your customer is 38 years old, that they like dogs, that they live in this section of uh, Pennsylvania, like in these like 50 zip codes, and that their name is Tom, then you can set up your filter criteria to meet that, right? So you can just cherry pick all the inbound leads to meet that. Does, is this guy's name Tom? No, then kill the lead or don't pay for it. You know, does he live in this zip? Yes or no. So I would definitely start by finding who you want to talk to and then build your filter logic around that. Um, while you do that, just be sure that, you know, it's kind of a catch 22, but be sure that you don't narrow your filter so much that you might mm -hmm. lose potential opportunities, right? Maybe what you do instead of just filtering out a hundred percent, um, you know, like let's say it's Pennsylvania in 10 zip codes. Maybe you open that up to 50 zip codes. And for those 10, you pay $50 per lead. And then for the rest of the 40, you pay $5 per lead or whatever that is. So it's really defining like what you want and then creating criteria to meet that and then pricing accordingly. That makes a lot of sense. And, and that's actually something that we specialize here in inventory. And we're seeing a lot of success partnering in the home services space. You know, one a use case that came to mind was we were working with a partner where they were, you know, they thought their ideal customers were 80 years old. And we came to find out by utilizing some data and some research that, you know, for that particular product that their, their kids were actually purchasing it on behalf of their parents. And so their entire audience that they were targeting and getting leads for was actually incorrect. So there's a lot of ways that you could work with your lead aggregators to narrow in on here's the, you know, the leads that we want to focus on. And like you said, you could disqualify some of the leads that aren't converting high or deprioritize them. You know, have your team focus on the ones that are the most likely to convert. Um, that's awesome. Thank you for that. So now we want to talk about speed to lead, right? So obviously you don't want to narrow things down too much where you end up not having enough leads to go through, but you also want to make sure that anything you implement or anything that you're working through with this process enables you to get you know, in front of these people as quickly as possible, especially if it's something that you know, you're, you're, you're up against the clock sharing these leads um, and trying to get them on the phone. Francisco, how important is speed to lead for Freedom Financial? And, you know, are you able to receive leads? Uh, how, how quickly do you react to them? How does that process work for you? Yeah, yeah I, so for us, I mean, speed to lead, I think 
anyone will tell you is always very, very important. I mean, um, I think, you know, even there's stats out there that talk about, you know, if you wait 10 minutes, you know, how much the, the close rate might go down, right? Or a half hour, an hour, right? So speed to lead is always very important. And you can also just look at your overnight leads, right? Overnight leads always tend to not perform as well. They come in late night, they've been sitting for six or seven hours. Um, but, you know, I think what's also very important is prioritizing, right, those leads. And I think that's something that's, when you're talking about balancing a call center, right, understanding which leads should be prioritized over other leads mm -hmm. in those moments where you're getting maybe, you know, a lot of leads within the last 30 minutes for whatever reason, right? Um, so I think lead routing, uh, lead scoring, um, so to help prioritize these leads is very important. How, how do you work the lead? Um, does every lead have to go to your own and operated call center? Can you leverage a third party one that maybe gets in front of it first because maybe it has a little bit lower intent? Now you still want to get to them quickly, but you want to prioritize, you know, uh, how these leads are routed around. Maybe SMS is a better way to try to engage with these leads in the future, right? We're using companies such as Drips to help you kind of nurture them along. Um, but ultimately, yes, speed to lead is very important, but then it's also very important to understand the value of these leads and the right way to um, engage with the potential customer. And it's not always tell it's not always the phone, right? Which is what we're learning these days. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other ways to engage with customers. Yeah, absolutely. John, how do you guys prioritize leads or how do you optimize that process for lead, lead priority for your company? Yeah, I think it, uh, a lot of what's already been said is, is what we're doing, but I, history helps you do that. So let's, let's assume you don't have history with the lead source. At that point in time, you're left to only be able to try to uh, prioritize based on a traffic source or a type of traffic source, and then uh, different uh, fields they filled out on the lead form. So let's, I'll pick on mortgage since I'm in the mortgage vertical. If, if somebody says, I want to buy a home in Denver, Colorado, uh, and they put in, I'm willing to spend $50,000, then we know no matter what credit score, they could put in an 800 credit score, we know that that lead probably doesn't need to be prioritized as high because they are not going to buy a home in Denver, Colorado for $50,000. So that, that's one example of what you can do before you have history is you really need to use uh, the – uh, what's coming, what's being posted to you in the lead to help prioritize. Once you've built history with it, then you start to see the conversion through the funnel, and that that is certainly how we're uh, prioritizing. Beyond that, there's time of day, right? If somebody is in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, and they fill out a lead at 1 a.m., but we are also operating in Hawaii, and you have somebody fill the same lead out at the exact same time, the person in Hawaii is probably more ready to receive a phone call. So uh, given that they're five hours behind us in, in time. So that's all the sorts of things you really need to look at it from the, cons the customer experience. Um, it can be thinking about, do I want to offer them di digital products at certain times mm -hmm. of day more than at other times of day? If somebody's calling, wants to call at 11 a.m. their time, call them at 11 a.m. their time. But if they're filling out a lead at two o'clock in the morning, I, you know, I have three kids. I am definitely not looking for somebody to call me at two o'clock in the morning, but I very well may be filling out mortgage leads at two o'clock in the morning while rocking a baby. Now I have a different way to connect with that user. Maybe it's a text, automated text. When would you like me to call you back? And then I can prioritize because if somebody actually offers a callback time, you can prioritize them. Maybe I'm offering them a digital product. If somebody starts to interact with the digital product, then I'm prioritizing them differently. All of these different behaviors and all of these different questions that they're answering, you're going to build that history. But if you don't have a history, I think Eric talked to it, it's, it, it's people who uh, are industry standards. You know, you're going to have a little more faith in that lead source quality, so you can probably mm -hmm. prioritize that. You know, look at different traffic sources, and then you're going to look for just things that don't make sense. The Denver, Colorado, fifty thousand dollar home. Unless they're really looking at that unique fixer upper, it's just probably not happening. Yeah, I'm sure Minnie Mouse or Mickey Mouse are also two things that you probably deprioritize. I don't know if they're buying homes in Denver yeah. either at this point. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, Grace, awesome. I was going to say um, just really quickly on this. Yeah, thing. please do. You know, I think the panelists have all said speed lead is critically important. And one thing that I would just encourage as a buyer, um, start tracking it. It's very important. 
So start tracking what your average speed to lead is um, or what your average contact is um, and start to look at your response rates and the probability of conversion as it correlates to how you um, shorten that speed to contact rate up. The buyers, we as buyers, it's important for the conversion of the ROI, but the aggregators are gonna be asking the same questions too. Because they're gonna be like, well, how quickly are you in contact with these people? Are you sending texts and you know? So that information and that free flow back and forth with the aggregators and the buyers makes a very, very good relationship. But when a, a, an aggregator is pushing leads to a business as a buyer, and that buyer it doesn't know their contact or their speed to lead, and they don't have a good history of what it is, it makes the aggregator want to go and not, you know, they'll go sell the traffic somewhere else where it'll convert higher or mm -hmm. they'll charge more on a cost per lead, or whatever the case is. So start tracking it, start getting a history around it. Um, and you're going to find your conversion rate uh, goes up once you start to get that baseline. Very good point. Thank you for that. You know, it seems like there's a lot of things to take into consideration. There's a lot of different, you know, tactics you can use. You know, I'm sure that helps me kind of segue to the next question around lead management systems. You know, there's a lot of options out there that help you make this process a little bit easier. You know, there's so much data. How do your organizations manage these leads? Bastion, I'm going to throw that one to you. You know, what's important for everyone, you know, who might be newer to this, this industry or is looking to refine that process? What do you look for in a lead management system? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hit it again. So the Leads uh, Council Buyer's Guide has a ton of great info <laughs> about this, right? Because it's like a super deep topic. Um, beyond that, Stephen R. Covey wrote a book called Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. And habit number mm -hmm. two is begin with the end in mind. So while you're evaluating lead management, lead management systems, make sure it not only meets the needs that you're looking for immediately, but like beyond, you know, six months, a year, two years, like what's your business going to look like? What um, systems are you going to try to integrate with? Like if you're currently leveraging a third party call center, will you in-house a call center? Would your lead management system support that? Mm -hmm. If you're using a really basic CRM, like sugar CRM, and then you want to move to a Salesforce or whatever, like, will it support that? So definitely scope out what the next six months to a year to two years to three years looks like for you and look at the lead management system to see if that's something that can grow with you. Yeah, it makes a lot of fun. Francisco, do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I, I, I agree with them. You know, for us, um, we've been fortunate enough that we really ju just used uh, Salesforce as our lead management platform. And, um, but yeah, no, yeah, I agree with everything they have said. Perfect. It looks like we got another question here. So in addition to filtering and scoring your leads, do you ever utilize a service like IntelliMedia? Does anybody have any input on that? I don't know IntelliMedia. Um, uh, I don't know the name offhand. Um, I think I think I could be wrong, but I think they might be a call center optimization uh, group. But you know, mm -hmm. there's a if that's the case, there's a bunch of different companies that will work on a performance basis to be able to work your back end lead scoring is what Rob is saying. Lead scoring uh, is is you know. You've heard the panelists talk a lot about it, uh, um, and it's hugely important. You know, uh, Imputer is a, a, a great example of a company that there can we do multi-attribute <laughs> and putting in together thousands of data points to sit, boil it down to a singular, like, this is the customer you want to be talking to. Um, and there's a ton of, of opportunities around uh, around that. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So now I want to move to, you know, something that's, that's very important, but not necessarily the most exciting uh, topic, but legal and compliance issues. You know, it's, it's important to note here that, you know, everyone on this panel, including myself, we're not, we're not lawyers, we're not, you know, we're not giving legal advice here. I want to preface that, but it's good to kind of get some insight on how you think about it. So Eric, can you touch on the, the things that lead buyers might be thinking about in terms of compliance? Uh, huge topic um, and uh, and a very very big one. Uh, you as a buyer, um, 
the, the lead generation space is a world of opportunity to grow businesses very fast. Um, but with that growth uh, comes a lot of compliance and a lot of, um, of, of focus to be able to do it the right way. And you only want to be working with companies that are doing it the right way. Um, again, not, a, um, not an attorney, but I can talk to you about what I look for in lead generators that are providing um, compliant leads. And, you know, TCPA, proper TCPA language on all of their lead forms is a must. Mm -hmm. Naming yourself as a buyer in the language is a must. These are things that cannot, uh, we don't accept if they are not. And I go back to, um, to companies like Active Prospect or Jernia, where you can have the ability to um, have a token or a live recording of the person filling in their form to be able to ensure um, TCPA opt-in is happening um, uh, as a way to just ensure that you are doing the right things. Um, you have to ensure that your uh, aggregators are following CAN-SPAM compliance, that you are providing them mm -hmm. with suppression files of, of that you personally have uh, to say, don't mail, if you're an emailer, don't mail to these names if they're in, if they're in your database. Um, there's a lot around that. Bastion has alluded to the buyer's guide a few times, and I would again encourage uh, to, to read about that. Um, the FTC is, is, has an eye on it, and uh, as long as we're doing the right thing um, in this space, uh, we can continue to grow the business. But the ones that are not acting in compliance as a buyer or a seller, I can tell you that their standpoint is that they are one and the same, that you, know, you can't distance yourself from being in the lead buying uh, arena and say, I just bought the lead. I don't know anything else about it. That's not gonna be um, uh, enough in the eyes of the FTC. So that's just, a, that's a couple from me. Okay. That's awesome, thank you. And I think we got a, you know, another question from the audience that's on this topic. If anybody has any experience or input on you know, what it's like and your feelings on utilizing an ad fraud solution to ensure quality leads, do any of you guys have one of those in place today and, and can maybe talk to it? So an ad fraud solution. Yeah, I can tell you, um, I don't mean to jump in, um, but it's something that uh, we at American Standard are looking very seriously at, um, especially in um, the world that we are in right now, in these unsettling times, uh, we are sitting mm -hmm. around um, a, a big opportunity for ad fraud to spike. And I think that the people that are using, uh, that are, are, are tracking that stuff, uh, like Andorra, um, they're going to be uh, forefront in the conversations around compliance uh, and saving companies a lot of money. Uh, and I could be wrong on the stat, but I think there's 20 to 25% of dollars being wasted in media spend and lead generation spend um, uh, due to ad fraud. So from my perspective, and again, the panelists can chime in here, whether you're using it on your primary marketing uh, for SEM or your any of your paid campaigns, or you're working with lead aggregators, you wanna make sure that they have a system that is compliant or that is tracking ad fraud, um, that is, uh, um, that they have that, you know, in their systems and their tech stack uh, when they're, you're working with them. And if you are buying media and you're buying paid search right now and you're buying paid uh, display, you would wanna be able to have that as well uh, on, your, on your own media. Anyone else wanna jump in on there? Or I'm gonna start to kind of wrap it up and hand it over to Rob soon. I think Eric covered it. Awesome, well, what I wanna do before we, we hand it over is you know, I want to ask each one of you, you know, what tip would you give the audience on successfully buying? So this can really, you know, you can as granular as you want, or it could be as broad or as basic as you want. But if you had one tip to give these guys, what would it be? Bastion, I'll start with you, and then I'll, I'll let each, each one of you go. Uh, yeah, so number one tip is just realize who you are in that conversation with the lead aggregator. You are the boss. You are El Jefe. This is your program you are responsible for it. You are in the position of power and authority. And if something's not working, it's up to you uh, to push it. 
and it's up to you to challenge your partners and your league aggregators because this is your thing so don't mm. be afraid to you know put on your big boy pants uh, so to speak and take ownership and realize that your position has you know some authority to it well said. love it john what about you yeah you need to be able to determine uh your 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 milestones your success milestones and what you're willing to to essentially pay for that and be willing to communicate that in some capacity to the aggregator consistently and that becomes really important in time frames like now when you're going through you know COVID-19 and and performance I'm sure has changed for everybody and if you are not in a mm -hmm. place where you know what it should be and are and can communicate it uh, back to your partner, then you can quickly uh, spend very inefficiently. And so I think understanding what your milestones are and how to communicate it back to your partners. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. I think a trend we, we've been hearing throughout this. Francisco, what's your one tip? Yeah, I'm going to probably repeat myself here, but I, I, I'm a big believer in understanding the customer journey from, from the impression all the way through when you're either buying that lead or even when you're generating your own traffic, um, understanding where that customer is in the cycle, how they've been advertised to, um, what incentives and or selling points are being put out there are just very important. And I think uh, understanding that customer journey is really important all the way from the impression to the lead. Perfect, Eric, last one, come out with a bang here. Yeah, you know, my my take is if you're coming to into the space of lead buying, lead buying um, my my biggest uh, suggestion is join the leads council. Join the leads council and start to network with buyers like John, like Bastion, like Francesco, like myself, mm -hmm. who can get on a phone call and have a conversation with you, or get on um, you know meet up at some of the trade shows like Lead Generation World and Leads uh, LeadsCon um, once uh, you know <laughs> uh, we get past <laughs> this stuff. Uh, join these council, these uh, these uh, expert panelist calls to learn. But by joining the leads council, uh, and I, this really, I'm not trying to make this a commercial, but honestly, it's a short circuit, simple solution to just get closer to the industry in one snap. Because I can tell you, it took me years and years and years of trying to break into it and trying to fully understand it. And heck, I don't even understand it now, all of it now. That's why Bastion is doing it all. So <laughs> I, my encouragement is to, to go onto, onto Leeds Council, you know, onto the website, I think it's leedscouncil.org, read about it, learn about it, and, and join. Um, Rob, you know, is hugely knowledgeable in the field and answers a lot of questions. Um, but that's, that's my take. And I don't mean to sound, make that sound as a commercial. No, I mean, I agree with you 100%. I can't tell you how much I've learned from all of you today and all of you you know, over the past couple of years um, at these at these conferences and on a personal level, you know, I, I really do feel like this industry, you know, can get a bad rap sometimes, but when you meet the people who are doing it the right way and are invested in it, it's a great network and they really are here to help each other. And I'm sure Rob can give us a little bit more details about Leeds Council and, and what that means. I hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I am El Jefe. Thank you, Bastian, for that. <laughs> and I appreciate all the other panelists not stealing that that awesome line. <laughs> um, Grace, Eric, John, Francesco, Bastian, I, I certainly appreciated all your time and insight. I know that this is a lot of time out of your normal schedule, and and it's all appreciative on my side that you're, you're volunteering this. Um, as Every one of you all talked about the, the council. Obviously, that's near and dear to my heart. I just posted the link to the download for the buyer's guide, so make sure that you, you click that and download that when you have a chance. I will be sending that out in a, another email when we do have this webinar video uh, edited down. Uh, also, you can go, as Eric had said, to leadscouncil.org. We have our resource hub where uh, we have our events hub where all of the uh, past webinars are housed and you can download the videos from them and any future webinars that we may have coming up. <clears throat> and then I also want to point out that we dropped our silver level membership down from $2,000 a year to $500 a year or $42 a month. That's a no brainer for what everybody is just talking about. This is just an easy decision to make in these times. And so, you know, once again, 
Infutor, Michelle, Dave, I want to I want to get a shout out to you guys. Did a lot of work on the back end and thank you very much for everything today. And we'll get this out as soon as possible. Uh, thank you all very much. This was was super cool. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thanks, thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.